Hey guys, Filthy Robot here, bringing you another guides, tips, and tricks video. This time, we are finally doing it. We finally reached the end of the How Good Is Each Civ uh, series, and we're going to do the tier and ranking list for all of the civilizations, six civilizations. So here we go. Let's jump right into it. Um, all right, first things first, we need definitions. Definitions so we can all be on the same page for how I'm assessing these. So you guys can get some sense of what these tiers mean to me and uh, give you a point to start from when you undoubtedly disagree. <laughs> so let's let's get our definitions done. All right, tier one, these are the top tier sieves. These are sieves that have bonuses that are consistent and game-changingly strong. These are things that are almost always or always happening and they're so powerful that they're gonna impact every single game they're a part of. That's uh, my tier one sieves. Tier two, these are very strong sieves still. Their bonuses are either consistently strong, so they're quite good bonuses, not the same level as the bonuses of the tier one, but they're there, they're there often, and they're still really good, or they're just as strong as those top tier bonuses, except they don't happen as consistently. Uh, so they're either consistent, strong, or situational and game-changingly strong. All right, tier three sieves, these are kind of the medium sieves, the mediocre sieves, the uh, average sieves. These sieves are sieves with bonuses that are consistent and mediocre. So they're there a lot, but they're not that great, the bonuses or they're situational and strong, so basically tier two level bonuses, but not applied all of the time. Um, tier four sieves over here, these are what I'm considering basically weak sieves. These sieves are uh, sieves with bonuses that are consistent and weak. So they're bonuses, but they're not very good, the bonuses they are kind of bad bonuses. Or they're situational and okay, situational and mediocre bonuses, all right? And finally, the, the tier five, the awful sieves here, these are sieves with bonuses that are consistently inconsequential, so they might be there, but you don't care because they don't do anything really, or they're situational and weak. Um, those are my kind of five tiers of sieves. Um, I'm going to talk about the rankings of, um, excuse me, the breakdown in terms of tiers. So if you look, I have the tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, and tier five on the right-hand side of the screen. There's three lists here. They're just the same sieves arranged differently. This is arranged just by tier. This is the order on the screen setup, uh, the setup screen rather. So when you in the game, if you're looking at your drop-down menu, this matches that order. And then this is the basically that again, but this time organized by, this is alphabetical. This is by the actual rankings I place them in, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, etc. So not only tier level, but also, um, also the strength of that of, of, of that sieve relative to other sieves. And if you think about it, really, you can think of tiers on, there is kind of a jump between a tier one and a tier two a little bit, a jump between a tier two and a tier three. Clearly on the borders, that's gonna be less of a jump. It's not perfect, but this is kind of the way that I mentally think of these. All right, let's jump right into it. Um, Scythia, just flat out best sieve out there. Uh, you can't compete with that 50, uh, 50 uh, health heal from killing a unit and extra uh, extra combat strength versus damage units. Everything else may be a little bit more situational. Horsemen are good in the early game. Uh, yeah, double light cab all the way through the game are good. Things like double helicopters, du double cavalry, really good. Double horsemen, really good. Double soccer horse archers, really good. But really, I think the deciding factor for me is not those things. It is actually uh, the 50% the fifty percent heal when you kill a unit and uh, the five combat strength combined with those other things in addition to a decent uh, decent start bias and a decent uh, unique building or unique tile improvement rather. It's just no one is going to have any sort of reasonable game starting near Scythia. Scythia is going to crush you and you're going to be very, very upset about it. Or if you do manage to somehow hold them off, your game is going to be over too. And that's going to be every game that Scythia has. So that's about as consistent and game-changingly strong as it gets. Uh, Samaria, very similar. Um, war carts are what's carrying this. The other bonuses are decent. The bonuses from uh, tribal villages out of barb huts, the bonuses from getting experience by doing nothing all the time, no matter where you are, including experience off your opponents, which makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, the opponents you're fighting with, but whatever. Um, it's really the war carts. Um, I did say in a previous video, 35 combat strength. They're not, they are 30 combat strength, but they're 30 combat strength. They're a heavy, they're a uh, heavy cab unit that upgrades into a knight that has zero upkeep to begin with has four movement if it's on flat terrain is available instantaneously and no one there's no counter to it there's no anti-cab units don't have bonuses versus it it just you're going to get more land that you don't deserve or you doesn't belong to you in terms of equal distribution as a uh, scenario than you are as any other civ basically right if you have a neighbor and their neighbor is close or with flat land between you and them that neighbor's dead if you have city states near you, the city states are dead. If if players settle too aggressively towards you, they're dead. Like these are war cards. They're going to be ridiculous. They're going to give you amazing early game, amazing mid game, and uh, amazing uh, 
because of that early amazing game, they're going to uh, translate into an even, even better uh, mid and late game. Just amazing Civ, super, super strong. And, you know, even the rest of their bonuses aren't that bad. The, their, their unique building is probably one of the better unique tile improvements. I keep saying unique building and meaning unique tile improvement. All right, Germany. Um, three, be able to place three districts in a city at uh, pop one. Be able to place uh, both the, the initial district you get for being pop one. Uh, Germany gets a free extra district, so that's district two. And then the Hansa uh, for district three. It's a incredible bonuses. Um, the Hansa is probably this tied for... It's probably the second best uh, district out there, maybe maybe third, but probably second best in terms of if, if you look at the rankings of districts, it's probably going to be an order of priority of building them. It's probably Commerce Hub slash Seaport or both if you can, followed by uh, Industrial Hub, followed by a Campus, maybe swapping the place of the Industrial Hub and Campus. Certainly not for Germany. For Germany, the Industrial Hub, because it's a bonus Industrial Hub, is definitely going to be either first or second one to build in every single city you have. Uh, but that's an incredible, incredible district. It just drives the, that combined with their district limitation upgrade and their extra military slot is just a phenomenal set of bonuses. The city state bonus, I could take it or leave it. Don't care either way, the U boat, who gives a fuck. But honestly, those bonuses there are enough. Germany, if it is given time to develop basic infrastructure, it's going to be a monster in the late game. ICS is the way to go, just as many cities as you can right now, uh, as you have room to fit. And Germany does this better than any other civ flat out. You know, if they're not killed, if they're not dying to war, they're going to basically out sim city everybody, which is awesome. It's, cons it's just consistently awesome. All right. However, why that order? I don't think you can beat out Scythia. I think if you had to, if, if Germany, Scythia, and Samaria were in a game, I'd bet on Scythia over everybody else for militarily for military early game. I would bet on Samaria being able to kill Germany. Germany doesn't have any defensive bonuses early. I mean, it does have that extra card slot, I guess, but that's not really much of a defensive bonus in the early game. Uh, I just, I don't think that Germany has the same ability to just, decimate whatever players next to them. Their Germany's going to be in the long run, be able to be better than them uh, and have better bonuses across the course of the game. But I don't think in the short term, it's going to be, Germany's going to be competitive with that. But uh, moving on, let's take a look at the tier two stuff. These are either quite strong bonuses or situational and amazing. Um, Russia, I drastically underestimated the uh, Cossack in my uh, initial video, in part because I just didn't really put together quite how much experience you get on online speed combined with uh, how much uh, uh, combined with BAME to promote after moving. So slam a unit, back off, heal promote. Two more slams, back off, heal promote. Like you, I, I easily have been taking down infantry with uh, Cossacks and Cossacks because they are a replacement for a unit as opposed to a, a new unique unit. And so they replace the, the, the cavalry unit. Um, that means you can pre-build horsemen and upgrade them into Cossacks, which means that you can do timing pushes with them, which is absolutely phenomenal. I also, the German, uh, not German, the Russian ability to, to take all that land when you settle is amazing. Uh, the Russian uh, empire may be the only empire that realistically can uh, uh, invest in, um, in faith buildings and holy sites uh, because they're the only, the only civ that gets half off holy sites uh, for, excuse me, who gets unique district holy strikes which doesn't count towards your district limit and additionally is half off so most civs you really can't fit in the timing to build holy sites it's still hard with russia to do it because holy sites just are not good compared to the other districts but it's still one of the few civs that even has a chance to do that and you can use that for mid in a late game uh, military pushes for very rapidly producing units particularly cossacks again and cossacks are monstrous they are so hard to stop in simultaneous play they are basically what the old camels and uh, Keshiks were of the Civilization 5 series. That's kind of what Cossacks are right now in Civilization 6, 6 because they can move after attacking. They get massive amounts of experience because they can they survive so much longer than other units would because you can attack, then pull back, or attack, take a little bit of damage, pull back, then heal, um, and you can, you can cycle them. So instead of, this gets around the unit restriction. Instead of having one tile that with one unit that can attack that tile from that one adjacent tile, that one tile now, if it has a road in particular, can cycle in four or five or six or seven units that can use that tile, attack, move back, attack, move back, attack, move back, get another one in. It's ridiculous, so, so, so strong. Um, China, just consistently good civ. China's not going to have bad games for builders, super good for on demand from the get-go, super good. That can be built by regular builders instead of being built by military engineers, super good. Um, 
the wonder rushing in the early game very powerful remember early game bonuses in my opinion have more of an impact on the game than late game bonuses the sooner you get them the better and early game wonders are particularly good wonders in general because they have to be because the amount of time you spend in the early game building a wonder is what you don't spend building things like builders settlers military units in the early game so they have to be powerful things like stonehenge things like petra uh, things like pyramids these are all really good wonders uh, in the early game and china gets dibs on any one of them that it wants because of the builder rushing ability uh, and then it has a very nice medieval era defensive unit that is going to be a monster inside of cities it has very very high combat strength very low mobility uh well it's not like it's not any more mobile it's just it only has one range so it's just going to be very very good in fortified in, in structures like encampments or in city districts uh, going to be very annoying to attack they're just going to have good games they're just going to be a consistently good sieve um arabia uh Early, early night rushes is, is Arabia is going to be Arabia's thing. They're going to be terrifying to be near because they're going to have a dominant um, um, medieval era unit that can be reached after three techs and doesn't have a strategic resource requirement and heals every single turn after attacking. Um, it's not quite as good as a Cossack, but it may be it may be the next best unit after a Cossack, honestly. Knights are already so good, they can be upgraded into from heavy chariots into a knight, so you can pre-build them before you get the tech. The tech is super accessible. They're very high combat strength at 48 combat strength in the medieval era, which is just monstrous. Heals every turn, uh, and... And because of how mobile knights are, it's very easy to move them up to attack a location. You can attack units from distance which is really nice because you can cross that distance in a way that melee can't and uh, because you're so mobile you can back out to heal by either pillaging farms or just backing out and waiting a turn to outside of the danger zone before coming back in which means you can slam cities to death with knights in a way that you couldn't in civ 5 but you definitely can in civ 6 because they're just monstrous units um and then in the mid and late game, uh, they have lots of bonuses to religion, making the religion actually give them things like science, culture, and uh, additional faith, which means that you can transition from an aggressive early game with war into a very solid mid and late game SimCity game, which means you can still compete with other players who haven't had war in the mid and late game. Um, I think they're incredible. They're, I love I, I love the how Madra, uh, Madrasas work in terms of not you can tech military while still getting using your culture to tech science that's so cool um while still going towards the governments that are going to help you the best it's just these bonuses are so so neat in arabia i think it's going to be consistently a fun a, a dynamic civ to play in a multiplayer because you're going to be you're going to be doing things you're going to be doing actionable like changing the map style killing players while still being a, a sim city monster it's going to be great um, Rome, I think, is right on the border of Tier 2 and Tier 3 for me. The early monument is really what's driving this for me. Uh, I think that early monument in all of your cities for free is a huge culture boost in a time when a, and a culture boost like that is very, very meaningful. It means they're going to hit their first government faster. They're going to hit their... Um, their first military policies faster if they want it. They're going to hit their builder and settler policies faster. Rome is just going to be ahead of you in the early game always because of what it can do with its social policies. And then it has legions to back up, uh, taking when it settles cities, it has legions to back that up for defense and baths to make it grow even bigger than you. So the same number of cities means Rome gets more population than you because it's gonna hit that housing cap limit so much later than you. And then uh, additionally roads so it can defend itself. Um, super super good bonuses altogether um not quite as aggressive as some of the other civs like russia or arabia or uh, samaria or scythia that it's just going to go oh you have land that's my land you have cities those are my cities like rome's gonna have a harder time doing that because legions just aren't going to be able to do that but the the land that rome does claim it's going to be able to hold on to and that land is going to be more efficient than a lot of the other civs in terms of the amount of population they can they can uh, with, uh sustain rather excuse me um, all right, moving on. Tier 3 stuff. Why Tier 3 here? I just think these bonuses as a whole are a little bit less flexible in the sense, or rather, they're not applied as often and as usefully as the bonuses in the tier before this. So they're just not quite as strong. Um, you know what, you guys? my con The comment section on my YouTube kind of changed my mind a little bit about Aztecs. I got a little hung up on the lack of synergy between creating free builders with Aztec and how hard that was. And then the actual bonuses the Aztec get, like the, whatever it is, the Legend of the Five Sons, the, the district building bonus. I kind of didn't really think about all the other ways you can get builders and all the things you can do with that. And the comment section really kind of changed my mind on that. Some great posts there talking about what was happening, what things you could do, things like you can rush spaceports, things like the fact that 
how you can just build builders instead of building districts in your city so that you can fit gold purchase builders and then get to the serfdom policy, which gives you five charges on a builder, then gold purchase a builder or hard build builders out of your cities with the production boost towards that or just the actual number of builders you're going to get towards that and just instantly finish, uh, well, not instantly because it's five turns, but finish all your districts without actually putting any sort of your own production into those districts. I think I undersold this a little bit and that combined with the fact that Aztec already get a pretty consistent three to five, three to six, three to seven uh, combat strength boost and each of their amenities gives you six cities worth of amenities as a opposed to four, these are really good boosts. Um, taken together, it kind of offsets the weakness, in my opinion, of the Eagle Warrior, and it uh, gives you, I mean, and even then, the Eagle Warrior isn't terrible. I mean, it's like, warriors are still helpful versus barbarians in the early game. It's just this nowhere near as good as I expected the Eagle Warrior to be. But the rest of those bonuses are still pretty solid. I think you're going to have fairly decent games with the Aztec if you really, you really have to focus on that strategy, I think, because that is going to be very different than how other civs play. So if you try to play the Aztecs like other civs, you're probably going to run into the fact that they don't have any bonuses to help you. But if you play them as a unique civ that has these unique abilities, I think that's going to be pretty solid. Uh, games that you have out of that so a, a decent civ an average civ here uh congo uh similar thought uh congo is similar thought a little bit to um rome here in a sense that congo does more with this land than every other civ does because it gets those early neighborhoods and that really drives this to this tier three for me in my opinion uh congo are going to be able to keep up with wider empires in the early to mid game right in the very late game it probably won't be as much science wise it's going to have to do something about that uh perhaps by uh killing a player or thinking about settling late game cities or something but in the early to mid game you don't have to invest quite as much infrastructure quite as much time in units for settlers and whatnot so you can invest more in infrastructure because you can grow your city so tall that they can actually compete with the the wider uh, empires out there um, and then there are lots of ways that you can start triggering those relic bonuses i think congo is going to really excel with production centralized production out of certain cities uh, with lots of relics stacked in them and uh, there are a couple ways you can do that either get those early very early artists that are sculptures or then get the archaeologists later or get lucky with religion essentially i think combined that makes congo a consistently decent sieve and i can't wait to play them more i actually had a lot of fun playing congo uh gorgo's greece the wildcard policy in Greece just by itself puts them in tier three, for my opinion. Uh, that extra government slot permanently from the very get-go that gives you access to any policy you want to put in it is amazing. Uh, that combined with Gorgo giving you a little bit of extra culture from kills, um, the rest of it, the Hoplite and the uh, Acropolis, I don't care so much about one way or the other. I don't think they're particularly great, but I do think the early culture from kills is really strong, and I think the uh, wildcard policy long-term is amazing. Uh, all, all across the course of the game. And I think that puts them at a solid tier three. They're not going to be a dominant force, but they also they should have consistent, decent bonuses across the course of the game. Um, Cleopatra's Egypt. This is a this would be a situational and strong type of tier three civ, basically, right? Those horses, it's, it's the chariot archers that even bring this up to tier three, in my opinion. All the rest of the bonuses I could take or leave. The river district bonus, that's not bad. Uh, that 15% production, to I think it's 15% production towards uh, districts is pretty decent, I suppose, um, on rivers. I don't care about the wonder stuff. I guess it's an, I'll take it rather than leave it if I just have the option. The rest of their bonuses are pretty mediocre. The Sphinx is okay if you do get a wonder or two out, but it's not great. Uh, but really, it's those uh, chariot archers. They are scary. They're, they're fast. They're very early. They have uh, very powerful combat strength. They're difficult to deal with. Um, Egypt is going to be, if you play Egypt aggressively, I think they're going to be excellent. Uh, if you just try to sim city on Egypt with no early aggression, I think you're going to find them. They're not particularly great. Uh, it's going to be that's that situationally strong, you know, you kill some player or that player expands too close to you and you get a city out of it, or you kill all the city states around you or whatever it happens to be that you're picking up more land than you would otherwise without having to invest in those settlers. Um, all right. Pericles is Greece. They're being carried here by that wild card policy, and they're right on the low end of tier three for me. Um, even like looking at it, I'm like, should I swap them with England? It's so, so close to me in terms of their relative power here. Uh, it's that wild card policy. The suzerain bonus for culture a little bit later is okay in the mid to late game, but kind of shit in the early game. Uh, their Acropolis is pretty shit, but maybe you can find one or two in your empire where it wouldn't be terrible. Hoplite is okay. It's 
really good versus horsemen and not so good versus anything else so that's okay as well but really it's that wild card policy slot that's driving that in my opinion uh victoria's england uh also tier three it's being entirely carried by the commer uh by the the harbor district the unique harbor district unique districts are just really strong and unique districts that are also districts that are awesome so commerce there's no unique commerce district but the commerce district's really good harbor district really good because those are both trade route districts each of those districts give you an extra trade route and trade routes are extremely powerful in this game right now uh so the gold is nice but it's really the trade route that's driving it the combination of both of course makes that essential i would i would recommend your build order being if you have to choose district build order i would recommend commerce harbor or harbor commerce doesn't really matter which order uh and then other stuff probably campus industrial those could be flip-flopped as well. It could be industrial campus and then anything else basically because those are the most important districts for your overall economy as a whole. And England just gets one of those super incre incredibly important districts, gets it half off in terms of production and gets it free in terms of po uh, the district limitation for uh, population limitation on districts. It's the same reason that the Hans is so good for the German uh, the German uh, people. This, that's that's what the harbor is for the English people here uh, in this this civilization. Everything else about England, I don't think very much of at all. So that is the bonus that brings them up to tier three at all for me. Everything else would be terrible uh, from their bonuses. All right, moving on to tier four, India. Um, oh, if we want the order from those, it's just like if you think about the way we're looking at those the tier three uh, civs in there. Think about the extra things that each of the, the higher level ones in those two. Like the Aztec have a couple of decent bonuses um, that are consistent, that are cr across those are just consistently a little bit better than the Congo bonuses, which are pretty but good, but a little bit better than uh, Greece's bonuses, etc. It's just a, a consistency and overall power thing slowly scales up in the middle of the, the tier three stuff. All right, tier four, um, India. I think they're going to be a punishment sieve. Like if you attack India, India is going to punish you. It's going to have really annoying defensive units like the Varu, uh, which are slow, but are obnoxious to fight with their, their higher base combat strength, the lowering of your combat strength, um, the additional war weariness you get from attacking India. Um, I don't think step wells maybe will be something useful, but I don't think they're going to be all that useful. Their religious bonus isn't very much, um, I don't care that much about India. I don't, nothing in that says this is going to be a good game for me. What it feels like is what it says is it's going to be a bad game for the person who attacks me. And that's a different thing. That that doesn't let you compete in the, with the civs who are going to have good games. If Arabia is on the other side of the world who just swallowed another empire with his, uh, his Mamluks or whatever they're called, you, you being India doesn't give you any way to compete with that type of lead that he's going to take on you. Yeah, if he does eventually come attack you, he's not going to like the war weariness and maybe if he attacks you super early he's not going to like your virus either but really you don't have any way to to make your game super good so this is the problem i start to see with the tier four stuff japan has moved down a little bit in my initial estimation of the game of uh, how powerful they were um in part because the unique districts are just so much better than half off districts the unique districts already have the half off cooked into them but they also don't count towards your uh, district population limit, which is really, really powerful. Japan gets half off of encampments, holy sites, and uh, culture districts. Cultural districts are quite bad as a whole. Um, holy site districts are very hard to fit in because there's so many other higher priority, priority ones. So even half off, you still struggle a little bit because you need to get that commerce hub, that industrial hub, and the... Uh, uh, campus and often if you're coastal at all you also need to get that harbor so what what pop do you need so it's one three uh seven ten for four so it's uh what then uh 13 it's every three right yeah so it's got to be what 13 pop before you're getting the fifth district and if you think of the districts harbor commerce industrial campus there's your first district that you get that's half off that you can actually afford for population which means those cities are pretty damn big if you're going coastal before you can do that and it's just not not as strong. Um, campments are very situational. The culture districts kind of suck, and it's really hard to make holy site districts be that good for you. The rest of the Japanese bonuses, uh, the district adjacency bonus is kind of nice, but the rest of them are not so great. The factories are okay, but those are much later. I don't know. They're right again. <laughs> I could I could see pushing them up maybe slightly better than India, but it's pretty close. I don't think they're as good as England just because of the way the, the district bonuses work off. But man, it's close. These these are. There's not a lot of distinction between 
number 15 and number 14 or number 15 and number 13. So we'll see, maybe you guys will talk me into it and we'll tweak this around a little bit. The goal is to keep this updated across major patches and possibly across some of the no, the no quitters uh, patches too. So maybe we'll see this get updated from time to time. All right, moving on, Brazil. Brazil's bonuses just don't seem very good to me as a whole. A couple of the adjacency bonuses maybe you could do something with. The battleship, um, no indirect fire really hurts battleships and the fact that you don't have to settle coastal cities to have coastal access really hurts uh, any sort of naval warfare on a Pangaea map. Uh, the great people bonuses are okay, but most of the great people aren't so strong that they're gonna change games in of themselves. So they're kind of nice little bonuses and fun little bonuses, but not often all that great bonuses. And then uh, I think the carnival, I think it's gonna be better if you have to try, if you're really trying to get one specific great person, I think it's probably better to run the, the specific uh, project than it would be to run the carnival to generate the great people for that. I'm just not thrilled about Brazil. I am. I will see as we play them more if we can find some niche way to make them actually do something decent. But meh, I'm not not thrilled about it. All right, um, France. They're just pretty junk, honestly. Um, their unique unit sucks. Their unique building, their unique tile improvement sucks. Their uh, unique ability is fun and interesting, but probably not that impactful in a game. It just gives you essentially extra intel, but intel that like another player is doing much better than you is not necessarily intel that you can use to make it better. It just means that now you get to hear blow by blow as their civilization is running away with the game and yours is not. And then their wonder, wonder production is, uh, it's okay but it's going to be pretty situational and the tourism bonus, meh. I just don't think very much of France at all. I think it's, I think those bonuses keep it out of, those bonuses are all positive bonuses. They're just not all that useful. So that would be the consistent, but weak part of tier four, which is much better than the tier five stuff. But I don't think it's, uh, I think it's probably the weakest of the tier four civs. Maybe you could argue Brazil's worse, but it's, it's again, they're so close in ranking. It's very difficult to decide what the difference between 17 and 18 is or 16 and 17. Those are very, very close uh, distinctions. All right, moving on, Teddy's America. Um, bonuses are consistently inconsequential. That's pretty much what I would, uh, I would describe. A plus five combat strength bonus is consistently inconsequential or situational and weak. Teddy's is like a combination of that. Five isn't that much, but if you think of the fact that you know, what do you actually look at that? What, what do you put an average combat bonus for Teddy at? Well, if it was always five combat bonus, you'd call that a consistent five. It'd be 100%, it'd be five, five combat strength 100% of the time. Well, what percentage of the time are you fighting off continent? 60, 50? Is it an offensive or defensive war? Well, I don't know. So maybe maybe we say 50% of the time you're fighting on continent, okay? In which case, that's basically an average of 2.5 combat strength. That starts to be pretty small of a bonus, maybe even inconsequential as a bonus. Eh. And that's the only bonus that really matters for them. The rest of theirs, the problem with their unique unit is it can't be pre-built and it can't be uh, upgraded into and then it can't be upgraded after until much later. Um, it has weird hill bonuses and stuff. Their unique uh, air unit is also runs into the fact that strategic balance really kind of makes that not as valuable as it could be. The way that science compresses in the end game, uh, late game units aren't all that great. And then additionally, uh, you move past the fighter so quickly into the jet fighter. The tourism stuff is super hard to make for multiplayer win. Yeah. So I'm not thrilled about those bonuses as a whole. They're just not good on a regular enough basis at all. And if anything, are quite weak. Spain pretty much only has the Conquistador going for it. Or maybe if you have Conquistador, because Conquistador, Conquistador is the only one that you can consistently trigger its bonus. And that is basically a 10, 10 extra combat strength melee unit if you put a missionary in its, in its tile. The problem is melee units are weak. Um, the Conquistador, thankfully, is a musketman replacement, which means you can upgrade into it, uh, which is good for pre-building them. So that's something. Uh, but pushing with me melee units without uh, horse units is hard. So doesn't have any bonuses to the units that you'd actually use aggressively. So the only other bonuses that maybe will come into play, the, the plus, it's plus one, plus one on trade routes off continent. That's so weak. That makes almost no difference whatsoever. The... Uh, plus four combat strength if it's a different religion is so it's situationally hard it's hard to do from a situational point of view religion is not very it requires you get a religion and the opponent you're attacking have a religion and that they're different religions and that doesn't happen all that often uh, though i guess if you combine that with the uh, policy that gives you another plus four from being different religions and then you get the conquistador maybe that combined but this so 
it's getting to be the number of things that have to line up for that bonus to be useful and then actually to help you much in the game is starting to get pretty high. I just don't think those bonuses are meaningful as a whole. And then Norway, Norway is, I don't know what's going on with Norway. Like, meh, all their units, <laughs> their units suck. Like their unique galley kind of sucks. I mean, it's all right, but it's a galley and galleys kind of suck. It, they're unique, their berserker is terrible. Coastal raiding is all right, but it's so like the bonuses you get out of that, you get a couple tribal villages, whoop de doo you know, like no one cares. Like, it's just small things that don't really add up to helping you win the game. The stave church is terrible. What am I doing with Norway? Like, I don't do anything with Norway. I just wish I had another Civ the entire game. So, uh, as a whole, hopefully that will give you some sense of the mentality. I guess I should, I should have run this at the beginning of the video, but I'll do it now. There are definitely some biases at play here for me. The first of these is I am coming at this from a multiplayer perspective. Multiplayer perspective is almost always Pangea, because if you're not on Pangea, isolation leads to runaways runaways leads to imbalanced games if someone's on an island you can't influence them and they have vastly better land or a very strong sim city sieve and you just can't influence them until much later in the game they often can run away with the game to a degree that you can never catch up we don't want that we don't want isolation we want to force the conflict of players being near other players so they have to account for military as part of the game uh, so that we was why we play on pangea which means there's just going to be a general trend towards devaluing naval stuff comparatively uh, uh, on a Pangea map. So there's some of that in there. It's definitely a multiplayer human component to this. So um, certain things you can do versus the AI are, are going to be valued differently uh, for those of you who only play AI compared to playing against human players. And then there are some things too, like we're already starting to mod the game a little bit. Things like deleting units has already been removed. Things like uh, chopping resources has been reduced in its amount of potency. So basically things like selling units for gold these things are out of the game already so some of that bias is going to creep into this as well but hopefully um what we're going to do with this is i'm going to put links in the description of this video to all of the sub videos that kind of have led up to this so if you're like oh i want to learn more about china there'll be a link in there to the, the china videos and you can go watch 20 minutes specifically about china uh, so all of those ought to be here. They've led up to this kind of compound list here. Uh, and I think it's a pretty cool experience. I got a lot of feedback in the comment sections of those videos and they helped inform my kind of overall rankings in my mind because I'm learning this game too. This is still pretty early into a game. Like when I made the Civ tier list for Civ 5, that game had been out for years and I've been playing that for hundreds and hundreds, probably at that point, thousands of hours. So the number of situations I had encountered compared to what I encountered now was vastly higher. So what this means is part of this process for me doing these videos Videos, is hearing the feedback from you guys so I can keep learning and incorporating this and then put out that knowledge to you guys as well. So it's, it's a really cool experience for me. I've been really, really enjoying it. This has been super fun to do this set of videos. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed it too. As I said, this will probably be an iterative process with this tier list. We'll probably keep updating this as major changes hit the game so that we can keep, uh, keep this relatively up to date or at least make versions that will keep it up to date as it happens. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching. I tried to keep this shorter. But man, there's a lot of content to cover in this, so this is probably going to be a little bit longer than my normal guide videos these days. If you did like it, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Uh, come check me out on uh, Twitch and come check me out on my YouTube. I make a lot of Civ 6 content. And if you haven't already, go watch the individual Civ uh, guide videos. There's some really cool information in there. This has been a super fun series, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Filthy out, and I'll see you guys soon.